she's there somewhere. together now and oh just hugging I've had the best hugs you know and it, it's it's just you know this is the Doctor Who life isn't it this is you know the warmth and the feeling of I was sitting in there I didn't realize these people were waiting to sign autographs right for me to sign them you know and I'm sitting there I'm chatting away and you know blah, 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 and, I, and if suddenly Jason looks across he said I think these people might like you to sign an autograph. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the thing about Doctor Who. You forget, because it's just like having family and friends in the room. And I think we've definitely broken a few quad rules today. <laughs> the have been coming thick and fast. Yeah, they have. Um, they have. Must kutches. Uh, kutches, for those that don't know the Welsh word, is a cuddle. And you're always guaranteed a cuddle from Katie, which is always a nice thing. <laughs> um, it's lovely to be back. It's lovely to actually be back. And this is um, the, the, a couple of times I've been up to Hoover Villain interviewed, so uh, thank you for indulging us. Um, it's great to um, be back. And obviously, as you said, it's nice to be back with sort of people. And but it's not been a, it's not been an easy couple of years. And the one thing I will say about you is that you have been an absolute beacon of light shining through the Twitter oh. with all your love and all your messages and I think everyone would agree with that. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things that I do believe that, you know, in an ideal world, I don't understand how we can all live on this planet and not be supportive and caring to each other and realise everybody has their story to tell. 
And instead of just having opinions and being angry, you know, I think we need to all show a little bit more care for each other, a little more understanding for each other. Um, and I thought this at this time during this pandemic, this was a time for us to be able to show that care and respect for each other. We don't have to like everybody, but we don't have to be aggressive in our dislike for something or somebody. And I think this is a big problem in the world right now, is that, uh, you know, that it's, a, it's a very difficult and, I think, aggressive time. And I think it's such a shame because we all share this planet together. I'm being a bit serious now, aren't I? <laughs> Should I go back to what's in there? <laughs> um, but I do honestly believe that the only way we're going to get through the climate change and all of the things and the issues we're dealing with is for us all to work together because it, it, this is our home and we share it, you know, and we we do need to start by being so nice to each other and that's the lovely thing about Doctor Who fans, unless you're arguing about which doctor you thought was best. <laughs> and I keep saying to everybody, there's only one doctor and an awful lot of really good actors, you know, who have all given it their heart and soul, you know. But the, the, the main thing about Doctor Who is the heart of the fans, because you are it as far as I'm concerned. Because that, without all of you, there wouldn't be any Doctor Who, would there? You know, so yeah, well, then it is right. Um, it's, it's true, and you are so precious. You really are. We're so lucky, and I'm, I'm, I feel so happy when I see you all and hear from you on Twitter. And I want to give you as much happiness as you give me. So thank you very much for that. You know, truly. Absolutely. Um, Can I be silly now? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you were in Oldbourne just a couple of weeks ago, I understand. Was that? You were. <laughs> did I know it? I don't know. Did you? I, 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 I we, they, they've done, um, I, Oldbourne is, is lovely and I know it means a lot to the fans. It does. I, I, I'm interested actually because obviously you, you but, go back there from time to time and you, you go back there. It's that's my last time. I, that that's is, it. We're done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. What does it mean to you? What's the village mean to you? Well, What's not, you see, that's like? the problem. It, it's become, <laughs> am I... No, I'm actually a phone call. <laughs> phone call. Oh, I forget. Oh, I'm on stage with a phone call. Oh, he's got one of those posh watches. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, I'm just receiving hello. <laughs> uh, no, I'm on the other line. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'll get my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, I'm just thinking, you know, it, it's hard for me to say this to you because Orbor means a lot to the fans because of the show. What, for me, it was a location. And I'm so short sighted, I didn't know where I was anyway <laughs> half the time. Um, but it, the, the thing to it was the longest location that we did, and it was quite an extraordinary story, um, which nearly didn't go out because they thought, oh gosh, we've got devils, and we've got churches being blown up, and you know, all of those different kinds of things. Um, and it was an, a fabulous story. Um, I'll never understand, though, why Unit thought shooting at Bok was going to make a big difference. <laughs> they love a gun, don't they, Unit? Um, but it was, you know, it was an amazing story. And, and uh, but I did actually on the the box set when we did the um, filming there. You know, one forgets that we have a life going on, um, and so going there was it was another location, and it was a lovely location, and we had freak weather conditions there as well. Mm -hmm. Because one day we woke up and John came in to feed me my piece of morning toast because I wasn't very good in the morning back then. I hadn't had children. Um, <laughs> and, if it, and he said, it's snow. And I said, don't be silly. He said, put your glasses on. I went, oh. Um, and it was. And then we had pure sunshine and so on. Um, and it was a great story. And, you know, for Roger, I mean, he, it was a fabulous and, and, you know, the special guests of getting Bessie to drive on her own, I really thought, you know, all of those things. But, you know, for me it was, John and I used to, that's right, and John and I would go off for several hours and we went to um, Averbury, which is another area around there, which is really, really interesting. Um, and we know a lot more about all those things now. 
Um, I mean, now even know what Stonehenge really was, where it came from, it's a lot older, and that's not where it originally was. Anyway, I won't get into that. I've been watching too many documentaries during that. <laughs> I can tell you all about mummies and tombs and... Um, anyway, um, I, that morning that we went there, John came to pick me up to because we always drove together everywhere, but all the time we were together, we ate together, we drove together. That's how well we got on. Um, poor John. <laughs> um, but we did, because we used to play all these games and do all these voices together in the car. Anyway, um, but that morning I had just, I think about two minutes before John knocked on the door, um, I'd just been told that, um, one of my, I won't go into any details, I don't need to, but um, one of my very recent boyfriends had died. So I went to Auburn, and I've never revealed that before because that was my private life. And I mean, in the same way as when I was in the theatre, you know, I had to go on stage 20 minutes after I'd been told my father had died. You, you have to leave your private life outside while you do your work and then you pick it up again. And that's why we talk a lot about when you're ill, about Dr. Stage, you know, when I was sleeping in the hospital, when my twins were really ill in London, I'm doing a show, so I'd be going in, doing the show, coming back, and then being mummy to my very sickly children. You know, and so sometimes one forgets that you, you know, even though you leave that out when you're actually doing the work, it was the downtimes, and John, you know, John was wonderful because he was the only person I that knew, and he got me through a lot of things because I was very young and yeah. I hadn't experienced a lot of death in my life at that time. Um, so, just a little side story. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't the greatest memory for me ever because I was dealing with two very different things, but it was still an incredible location, and I think a wonderful story. And I like Joe. I like Joe. <laughs> no, no, he's a good man. <laughs> Take me. Tell me not, not him. <laughs> <laughs> I am slightly overacting just for your benefit there. No, really. <laughs> No, I, I anyway, I just back. thought I'd just tell you that story because sometimes, you know, when you ask a question like that, you have to say, well, no, that's what just happened, you know, and it was a very traumatic loss. Yes, and it wasn't, and, and also, it wasn't a, a, a quarry or a somewhere in the, no. the middle of nowhere. Was no, it, well? it wasn't a quarry, um, and I was wearing... Of course, if it had been a quarry, I would have been in a miniskirt. <laughs> but because it was a relatively nice place with no quarries or anything like that, I was wearing a suede trouser suit and flat boots, which is why I fell over all the time. Because I did, you go back there and you look at the one thing I do remember is you go back there and you, you know, I mean, it's an awful thing to say, but John and I sat down, we've had cups of tea and sandwiches on some of those gravestones. And you think, well, actually, if I was one of them under there, I think it'd be quite nice to have John Pert, who sees every nice cup of tea. <laughs> Something doesn't sound right there. <laughs> but you, you know what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, but I, I, I can't walk in very flat shoes. I fall over because I forget to pick my feet up. Because I come from the generation of um, stilettos, darling. You know, it's all my mother had in her wardrobe for me to dress up in. So, obviously, um, and um, <laughs> I come from that world of very, very high stilettos and tight skirts that when you had to get onto a bus, right, you had this problem, right, because your skirt was so tight. So you had to learn to get onto everything sideways and get into a car, swing your legs. I mean, we had to learn a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, it, I can't walk. And also, after my car accident, one of my legs is now very much shorter than the other. And heels help me remember to lift both feet so that I don't walk with the limp that I do when I have flat shoes. Anyway, I kept falling over at Allborn, and, and they say, 
the camera. So that Katie just tripped over again. You'll see there's a few balls that kept in. Because Barry let said, oh, don't worry, she'll get up again. <laughs> They speak to Jodie like that. <laughs> ah, I should get up. <laughs> but it's true. And also, it's much more realistic, isn't it? If you kept every shot that nobody ever fell over, you can't tell me you'd be running away from a, 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 a stone statue with its tongue hanging out and baggy tights on that you wouldn't fall over. You know, I mean, it, it just to me, it's more real that you trip, you fall, you bang into things. That's makes it more real. It does. Um, and I mean, we've had an opportunity to look back now over, actually we've, we've been revisiting the, the, the stories once again with the Blu-ray releases, and you've had a chance... What do you mean I've been revisiting well, them? Well, we're re revisiting them from a point of view of looking back on them, you're doing a couple of new documentaries, you're doing yeah. the behind the sofa stuff, which is good fun. And you get yeah, to but then you're with Stuart Bevan, who's well, never seen point. Doctor Who. <laughs> um, he, he's seen The Green Death, because I always tell this story about Stuart. No, I, I know what you're saying. You know what I was saying. But, you know, you, you have to remember, I can't see those screens most of the time when we're doing those things, so I don't know what's going on. And Stuart um, and I have been, to, been, you know, we were engaged for seven years, I mean, and then, you know, we've been absolutely strong buddies ever since. So when I go down there for the weekends, I, I do the cooking and the sewing and the, you know, he says, oh, I've got a button off by you. Can you put a button on for me? Oh, that's lovely, thank you. And, and then he sits down and he plays his guitar and he sings. And I go into the kitchen and listen to the archers and make dinner. Um, and I know, it's so sad. Anyway, we put the telly on, right? And I remember you were doing the behind the sofa, Stuart and I, in that one. It was hysterical because all I could think of is that when Stuart and I watch television, he doesn't like much. So you put something on, you say, oh, I can't stand him. I go, oh, okay, we won't watch that. Then. Oh, I, oh, I can't stand cookery program. Oh, right, okay. So, uh, oh, no, 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 oh, no, oh, no. So eventually I wait and then I say, I wait. And then I can see slowly his little eyes are closing. <laughs> and I've got the dog and I then go to sleep, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> and then I reach over and I just touch the clicker, as I call it, right? I just touch the clicker and he's like Father Jack. You know, <laughs> so, they, ah, there, there's him. <laughs> so when we were doing behind the sofa, this is all that would come to me was the fact that but we had a plastic screen which I kept forgetting was there, so I couldn't you know. But um, and then we started for no reason because he it's really hard behind the sofa, you know. And he didn't really want to watch it. <laughs> he wanted to chat. So you have to, to work it differently. It was like when we did the other one with, um, and it was John Levine. And, and Richard was waiting till he came on before he'd say anything. <laughs> so I'm going. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they're, they're really interesting to do. And it's interesting when you get paired up in the different combinations as well. Obviously, like you say, you've got Richard and you've got John couldn't have two different personalities sat either side of the No, I was like Wimbledon for me. <laughs> and, and then of course there was, they put on one where they were both in it, and then there was two that they weren't in at all. And I said, what do you think, Richard? And he said, I don't know, I wasn't in it. It's not quite the point really, is it? <laughs> But you also get to watch other eras of the show as well as part of these behind the sofas, don't you? I haven't. You haven't, have you? No, I will do, I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure. I love <laughs> a little cat um, out of the bag there, possibly. But um, I would much rather watch somebody else's. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much more you can say because you're seeing it for the first time. You know, I, I, think it, I think they should do that. I think they should have people that weren't in it watching it more than the people that were in it, to be honest. I agree entirely. I think it's much more interesting. Um, we've obviously still got a season still to come, to be season nine, which is a great season. We've not had that one Don't yet. know nothing about it, Governor. No, see, I'm, I am trying, guys. I'm trying to get it. <laughs> I have got some new goodies coming out, oh, but... Oh, well, then come on, then. Tell us about it. Nothing to do with your box sets that I know of yet. Kind of. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Spill. I can't 
can't remember Matron said I didn't take my medication. <laughs> is that a no then, is it? It's not in anything. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you've got, obviously, you've, got, you've got season nine to come, and mm. talking about the unit family and everything else, and obviously Nick, um, can't, can't go through an interview without mentioning at least say hello. Listen, Nick, Nick, that was good, wasn't it? Nick, uh, Jagger. No, Nick was um, one of the loveliest, most gentle, genuine, sweet souls you could possibly imagine working with, and... You know, he did have, as we know from interviews where it was brought up, you know, he had certain issues, but we were all well aware of, you know, we were a very, very close team. You know, that included Roger, John, me. Um, you know, we weren't always with UNIT, obviously, but, you know, there was, a, there was tremendous friendship and support for each other, not just in work, but outside of work, you know, we were all there for each other, um, and that, and that, and that, I think, comes across that there was this very special relationship, not just between me and John, but between the whole team. And I, I feel very blessed to have worked, and and not just them, also, you know, the people working on the show, or your Brian Hodgson's, you know, the the, the you know Barry Letts you know, Tarrant Sticks, it was really, really close. And the great thing for me, I was involved in everything. I was never that, you know, we know that a lot of women say they were left out or they didn't get, I was involved in absolutely everything. I was never dismissed any thoughts that I had or any, you know, ideas that I thought might make something better. It was always listened to. And I, I applaud the team that I worked with for never ever making me feel like the, the little one, you know, because I was very young and I was learning and growing up while I was working. And then we come to, you know, like, who knew all these years later that the joys that Big Finish have brought to us. Um, you know, I get to play Joe, jo Grant, Joe Jones, um, and I also got to play, I've done um, Dorian Gray, I've done Dracula, Iris Wild Time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. I mean, you know, I mean, she was actually quite before her time, wasn't she? But she's basically a time lady. And she's been running around with the bar and the bar. And I love her because you always, she's got this reputation for being drunk and that woman knows exactly what's going on. <laughs> Those little eyes, no, she know that. She's she's lived many lives as that woman. Um, and I've just done three books actually for Paul Mars that will be out soon that I hope you'll be brave enough because I've done 50 voices in it. How many? 50. I was coming and, and I do them as they come off the page. Plus, you're going into all of the narration. So you're doing them almost side by side, the different voices. Oh, well, they're all interacting. Like I did, you know, when I wrote my own play. Um, I did that in Me and Jezebel. I played nine. In my own play, I did 26. And then in The Scorchies, I did... They didn't realise that it was me doing Cool Cat, Dolly, Mr. Cleverman and Joe and that you do them as they come off the page. I don't do them individually. And because people say, how do you do that? I say, you've got to be completely mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I've always done that. And so, the, so suddenly I'm going from a massive great wardrobe that's got doors that are flapping that eat people. And then you go into a depressed vending machine called Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, but I had to find what she he told you to sign up saying get her off. No, 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 he's holding a sign up, but I couldn't see it, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go on as long as we want. I know. I remember, um, I remember doing live TV, and they put signs up, and they forgot that I couldn't see without my glasses. <laughs> you know, and they're giving me the wind up. I didn't know what they were doing. Get off the floor. What are you yeah, doing? You know. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, 
yeah, with, with, with these ones. So you've got, and of course, you have nobody to tell you what to do because I had no director. Um, we were just at, you know, COVID time, and I had the most wonderful um, tech, but he was French and made jazz. Um, so he didn't really know when I got a word wrong, which with my eyes is quite helpful because with a book, you can't mess around with any of the dialogue like you can in an audio play. Um, you know, like when you're working like I did with Sir Derek Jacobi, you don't mess with the words. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know when I do Joe, I, I have been given dramatic license. You know. um, but with this, you know, it's a book. So you can't mess around with the thing. So there I am. He's coming back again. No, it's not. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should we all sign up to him? Um, yeah. An answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <No. laughs> anyway, so it, 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 it's, it's quite traumatic because you've got, like, you've got, and then I played all these children. I even had to do Andy Warhol at one point. Yeah, I know you need to read these books. They, and I said to Paul, this, he said, they're the most bonkers books I've ever written. Really? And apparently I, they said, oh, well, we only wanted you to do them. I thought, should I take this as a compliment? <laughs> um, but multi-voicing is something that I, but it's something you have to be able to go from emotion to emotion because each character, you know, if you've got a little kiddie talking, you know, you've got a little kitty talking and then somebody comes in and you've got to have every voice and emotion, you know, going in your head. <laughs> and I th but I had to visualize, if you're a vending machine and you're depressed because your crisps are stale <laughs> and, your, and your pot is flat, right? How are you going to, you've got to visualize these characters. You know, you can't just, you know, I played a, a, a hyperactive cotton bud once, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know people wonder why I'm a bit nuts. <laughs> and, you know, so suddenly I could see Barbara. And so I realized that you had to have, well, there I, my crisps are so and you know, and she can't move very fast. Well, because she's a vending machine. <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm finding it really hard. And then, you know, and then the water, and then, and then you've got the kiddies, and then you've got the normal kind of northern people. And then you've got little tiny people who live in jars. And then you've got things made out of plastic garbage bags and tin cans who <laughs> you know and you and then another so you're doing all this all the time and I love it <laughs> except when I come out of the studio and I get on the bus and I go to say thank you I have no idea what voice I was because <laughs> my children used to say mommy who are you going to be when you come home tonight <laughs> Sounds fun. I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience while uh, I've got the opportunity. Sorry, I hope that was interesting. It was I think that was interesting. I'm going to take a couple of questions. Anybody, anybody got a question for Katie? I've got one down here. Um, what was it like working alongside Jeff Well, he was sitting there in a beautiful blue cashmere sweater. <laughs> Car. Collected. He's delightfully charming, you know, and he's got that lovely twinkle of humour. Well, I haven't heard it back, but I remember doing it, because it was over two years ago that we actually recorded it. You know, a lot of stuff you hear was done two, two years ago, three years ago, you know. Um, and of course, I had to run the gamut of emotions. <laughs> so I'm in there, and I, you know, I'm perspiring, my hair's like this, you know, and I kept looking over and He's just so calm. <laughs> I've always wanted to be that person that he is. You know? But it was an honor and a treat. And I mean, you know, a, a Big Finish now have just about every top actor imaginable. You know, we are working with such extraordinary performers. You know, we're all 
really, I've got some more coming up which I think you're going to like. <laughs> I mean, some is Joe and some is I. And well, there's more. Um, but that was the second time I'd worked with Derek Jacobi. I'd done another thing. And also, a lot of people, when I did Torchwood, I'd also been in a Torchwood where 